Hello and welcome to Vatican Connections. I'm Emily Callan. Why not start this week with a little dose of hope? At his Wednesday general audience, the Holy Father focused once again on the virtue of Christian hope. What gives hope, he said, is knowing each are loved by God, whom we can call Father. Here's a summary of his catechesis. Dear brothers and sisters, in our catechesis on Christian hope, we have found the source of that hope in God's unconditional love, revealed for us in the coming of the Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit. None of us can live without love. Happiness comes from the experience of knowing love, freely given and received. So much unhappiness in our world is born of the feeling of not being loved for our own sake. Faith teaches us that God loves us with an infinite love, not for any merit of our own, but out of his sheer goodness. Even when we stray from him, God seeks us out like the merciful father in the parable of the prodigal son, offers us forgiveness and restores us to his embrace. In the words of St. Paul, while we still were sinners, Christ died for us so that we might become beloved sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. Through the resurrection of Jesus and the grace of the Holy Spirit, we become sharers in God's own life of love. May all of us find in God's embrace the promise of new life and freedom, for in His love is the source of all our hope. The Council of Cardinals met for the 20th time this week. They met with Pope Francis for three days at the Vatican. Greg Berg, Vatican spokesperson, held a press briefing detailing the topics that had been covered. Their main concern was the reform of the apostolic constitution of the Roman Curia, namely on how to better serve the local churches, decentralizing Vatican dicasteries, that is, transferring some of the work to local bishops and councils, and dealing with unmarried or widowed deacons. They reviewed the work of other dicasteries, for example, for interreligious dialogue, for oriental churches, legislative texts, and tribunals. The Secretariat for the Economy and for Communications also presented the Pope with updated reports. In preparation for the next Synod of Bishops on Youth, Faith and Vocational Discernment, the Synod's General Secretariat launched a new website. It's aimed at promoting the involvement of young people, especially by answering a questionnaire. It is available in five languages, in Italian, French, English, Spanish and Portuguese. Answers need to be submitted by November 30th of this year, and those answers are meant to help the bishops better prepare for their meetings in October 2018. 20 new members were appointed to the Pontifical Academy for Life, founded by John Paul II in 1994. The Academy now has 45 ordinary members and five honorary members, and they come from 26 different countries. Among them, the Pope named two Canadians as ordinary members. Bishop Noel Simard of Valleyfield, he is the Francophone spokesperson for the Canadian Bishops' Conference on Bioethical Questions, and Professor William F. Sullivan, professor at the University of Toronto in Family Medicine. He is also the president of the International Association of Catholic Bioethicists. The Pontifical Academy for Life exists to promote the dignity of the human person and of every life. The Pope officially opened the Vatican office Scolas Ocurrentes Foundation last Friday. The Pope gave the international organization pontifical status in 2015 and it now has a headquarter at the Vatican in the Trastevere neighborhood in Rome. And to inaugurate the new office, he did a Google Hangout with kids from nine countries. The Scolas Ocurrentes find their origin in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 2001, when Pope Francis was then Archbishop Jorge Bergoglio. 
The organization's goal is to integrate young people from private and public schools of all faith backgrounds in working together for the common good through education, art, and sports. The Pontifical Foundation is responsible for creating and overseeing a network of schools all over the world. Did you know? The popes have their own tailor. It's been the same man for over 50 years. His name is Raniero Mancinelli and his shop is located on the Borgo Pio. So far, he has dressed Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI and now Francis. But he does not dress only the pope. He also receives requests from cardinals and priests. Canadian Minister of the Environment Catherine McKenna was at the Vatican this past week. At the end of the general audience, she got to greet Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square. She was in Italy for the G7 summit in Bologna, a summit focused on the environment. But the Canadian Minister also took part in meetings at the Vatican on migration and climate change. She was interviewed by Vatican Radio and talks about the importance of the Church's leadership on climate change issues and what it means for Canadians. Well, it's been really incredible to see the Vatican and the Pope's leadership on really important issues, issues to Canadians. Environment and climate change uh, is very important, but also issues relating to migrants and refugees and the Sustainable Development Goals. And I mean, I think what I'll bring back uh, is the opportunity for us to work very closely with the Vatican on issues that are very important to our government. Prime Minister Trudeau's government is very committed to the environment issues. How important is the commitment of the Church and in particular of Pope Francis, in your opinion, to protect the environment and to face climate change and especially global warming? Well, I think the leadership of the Pope uh, has been extraordinary on, on the environment and climate change. And I think it's really important because we have to be talking to as many people as we can uh, about the challenges that we face. We only have one planet and we need to be working together. And I think that the Pope has a real opportunity to reach Catholics around the world and beyond to get them really to act and realize that everything, every single thing you do has an impact on our planet. And we have to be very thoughtful about that. And also we have to be supporting poor people, people in less developed countries who are feeling the impacts of climate change already. Pope Francis has repeatedly stated that uh, taking care of the environment uh, also means taking care of the poor. Uh, for the pontiff, there is a link uh, between environmental degradation and poverty. What do you think about that? I, I couldn't agree more. It's actually really unfortunate that the people that are le least able to protect themselves against the impacts of floods, of forest fires, of droughts, um, or a melting Arctic in Canada uh, are people who, who often live in poverty. Uh, in Canada, we've seen the disproportionate the impact of climate change on our indigenous peoples, in particular our Inuit in the north. And I think it's just a reminder that climate action is also very good social policy, that you need to be helping people so that they can, can adapt to the impacts of climate change. Uh, finally, uh, a few days ago you were in Bologna for the G7 on the environment. Uh, following the announcement of President Trump uh, to withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement, what are the prospects, in your opinion, for the commitment to take all, uh, climate change? In spite of the, the position of the U.S. administration, which was extraordinarily unfortunate, uh, everyone else is committed, and I've been really heartened to see not just other countries uh, and my counterparts at the G7 committed to climate action, but you've seen uh, states in the United States, you've seen cities, businesses, uh, and, and people around the world understanding that this is our, our one chance. Uh, I have three children, and it's really about what kind of future we want. Next November, the Church will mark the first World Day of the Poor. In anticipation of this upcoming day, the Vatican released the Pope's message for the occasion, titled, Let Us Love, Not With Words, But With Deeds. Archbishop Rino Fisichella, President of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of the New Evangelization, presented the message to journalists on Tuesday in a press conference. The day was established by Pope Francis at the end of the Jubilee Year of Mercy, so last November in 2016, at the Vatican. 
Archbishop Fisichella recalled that the Holy Father was deeply moved specifically by his special Jubilee celebration with the socially marginalized that same month and believes it is what inspired him to launch this World Day of the Poor. So here is a summary of his message. He began his message by indicating the contrast which exists between our words and our concrete actions. God loved us first, he said, and such love cannot go unanswered. Although God gives his love and his mercy unconditionally, when a person receives it, the natural reaction should be to be stirred to compassion for our brothers and sisters. The first communities took to heart the words of the gospel, that the poor are blessed and heirs to the kingdom of heaven. They sold everything in order to help those in need. He quotes the Apostle James, who says that faith without works is dead. That's why God raised up men and women who have devoted their lives to the service of the poor. For example, Francis of Assisi. He embraced lepers, gave alms, and stayed with them. The Holy Father points out that occasional volunteer acts are also not enough if they don't allow people to encounter the poor, to share in their life. If we truly wish to encounter Christ, we have to touch his body in the suffering bodies of the poor, the Pope writes. Poverty is a call to follow Jesus in his own poverty. It requires humility to accept our limitations and sinfulness. He also urges the poor to not lose the sense of evangelical poverty that is part of their daily life. Everyone is challenged by poverty in various ways. Despite the wealth that exists, poverty continues to grow. Pope Francis goes on to explain why he wanted to offer the Church this World Day of the Poor, so that men and women everywhere will turn their gaze to all those who stretch out their hands and plead for help. It's also meant to encourage believers to reject the culture of waste, of discarding the vulnerable. Last weekend, Pope Francis made his way to Italy's presidential palace for a courtesy visit to the head of state, Sergio Mattarella, his first visit to the palace since his election in 2013. But at that moment, Giorgio Napolitano was leader of the country. The presidential palace, also known as the Quirinal Palace, is in Rome, only a few kilometers away from the Vatican. Matteo Ciofi has more details on their visit. The Holy Father and the President of the Republic had a private conversation, followed by an exchange of gifts, and then they stayed briefly in the chapel of the Annunciation. Work, especially for young people, family policies, and again the challenge of migration and the threat of the terrorism, these were the topics covered by the Pope and Mattarella in their meeting. They also touched upon these uh, themes during each of their speeches. I look at Italy with hope, the Pope said, a hope that is rooted in grateful remembrance of parents and grandparents who are also mine since my roots are in this country. The Holy Father mentioned several issues, including the crisis of migrants and then the earthquake which struck Italy last year. He said the way in which the state and the Italian people are facing these problems are expression of their sentiments and the attitude which find their most genuine source in the Christian faith, which has shaped the character of Italians and shines the most in dramatic moments. Regarding the migrant issue, Mattarella replied that it is Italy's duty to care for those arriving on their shores, and he hopes that the international community, as well as the European community, can take on greater responsibility on that matter and cooperate together in the future. At the end of this speech, Pope Francis remembered that Italy has the single task and honor of having the seat of the universal governance of the Catholic Church. And thanking the Italian state, the Holy Father added, despite the insecurity of the times in which we are living, the Jubilee celebration took place in a tranquil manner and to great spiritual advantage. The Holy See is fully aware of and truly grateful for the great commitment ensured by Italy. At the end of the meeting, the Pope greeted the children assembled in the garden of the Quirinal Palace 
Many of them uh, travel from areas affected by earthquakes. The pontiff encouraged them to continue following the alpinist example to rise up after falling, trying to climb always higher. A delegation of bishops from Albania made their ad limina visit this past week. The Pope visited the country in 2014, a country which was under communist rule for many years. And many men and women suffered because of their faith, but also because they were defending the rights of the most vulnerable. Vatican Television took the opportunity to look at the history of the country, and Bishop Angelo Masafra, president of the Episcopal Conference of Albania, was interviewed and spoke of the significance of this meeting for the bishops. The papal meeting with the bishops of Albania in their ad limina visit could be described as a one hour and a half conversation telling the story of a country the Pope visited in September 2014 and listening to suggestions and recommendations from the pontiff. Their church has a past marked by suffering having gone through 50 years of communist dictatorship but now, the Pope encouraged, it can live following the example of the 38 martyrs of the regime, whose faith in Christ cost them their lives and who were beatified last November. Monsignor Angelo Massafra, Archbishop of Scutari and President of the Episcopal Conference of Albania, remembers the pontiff's visit in Tirana, when Pope Francis experienced the pain of that land through the testimony of a priest, Father Ernest Simoni, now a cardinal, who, under communist regime, was incarcerated, tortured and subjected to forced labor. The Pope was extremely touched by coming to Albania and hugging Father Ernest, who has been in jail, and hugging a nun who lived in poverty. Pope Francis's exhortation is never to tire, to work together so that we can keep the evangelizing according to our martyrs' example. We can let them speak through us, let them be known by the people. Albania is going through a particular moment. The next few days there are going to be political elections, which have been the object of tensions and conflicts, explains Monsignor Massafra. There were problems. The opposition didn't agree with the government's decisions, and that was the cause for great risks. So what we did was push towards cooperation so that the Catholics, Orthodox, Muslims, Sunnis, Bektashis, and Evangelicals could make a declaration altogether. We did it, and it was something beautiful. We were expected from the observant people of Albania to provide kind words, just words, strong words, in order to shake them. We told them that it is important to respect other people's ideas, that it is possible to express their own social and political ideas, but without making damages. Regarding the elections, we reminded them not to sell or buy votes to decriminalize politics. After having gained freedom of religion in the early 90s, the church is now facing shortage of funds and infrastructures, which, even if improved, are still inadequate to reach part of the Catholic population living in remote areas of the country. Another subject of conversation with the Pope was the drop in vocations, but, on the other hand, they also underlined the strength of the faith, despite the secularization going on in Albania. While we were giving the Pope all this good news, he gave us suggestions and recommendations. Speaking of the diocesan seminary, Pope Francis warned us of the worldly spirit that can ruin bishops, priests, and the clergy in general. And if a priest lives by the worldly spirit, he is not able to attract vocations. He has to live with consistency, faithfulness, joy, and happiness. If you are happy inside, it shows, and that way you will be able to attract other vocations. One more highlight at the Vatican was the Holy Father's meeting with another delegation of bishops, this one from Venezuela. Eight leaders of the Episcopal Conference held a long-awaited meeting with the Pope. They spent half an hour discussing the current political, economic and social crisis the country is facing. The Holy See has been closely following the situation and even said it would be prepared to help mediate dialogue between the government and the opposition. 
Pope Francis met with the Venezuelan delegation for half an hour. Six bishops shared with the Pope the very grave situation the country has found itself in lately. They wanted to give the Holy Father a direct, clear, stark, and realistic vision of the situation, insisted the Archbishop of Caracas, Cardinal Jorge Urosa Savino. What we are seeing is a people who are suffering, who are humiliated, and who are cruelly repressed, he added. The bishops handed the Pope two documents detailing the situation in Venezuela. One of them is a report on the work of the Episcopal Conference until now. And the other was a list of names of the 70 people who died during the violent manifestations which erupted a few months ago. The bishops accuse the Maduro government of violating human rights. According to a study, 75% of Venezuelans have lost an average of 20 pounds in the last year because of a food and medicine shortage. Many suffer of malnutrition. Yet Venezuela was once one of the richest countries in Latin America thanks to its oil resource. The bishop's prayer is that the government would resolve the problems it has caused and not continue to impose as a government a regime which is socialist, communist, Marxist, totalitarian, and military, explained Cardinal Savino. They also criticized Maduro of creating division between the bishops and Pope Francis, that is, making it look like the head of the Catholic Church is on his side. Cardinal Pietro Perlin, Secretary of State and former nuncio to Venezuela, already pleaded with the Maduro government to hold fair elections, respect Venezuela's constitution, and free political prisoners. This has not yet happened. Last April, President Nicolas Maduro announced he would create a national constituent assembly. The bishops say it is a tactic to remain in power. Nicolas Maduro was elected in 2013, and today 70% of the population hope for his departure. If only writing to the Pope were as easy as pressing send at the end of an email. But despite his presence on Instagram or Twitter, the leader of the Catholic Church does not have a public email address. However, this wasn't always the case. When Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI was elected, the Vatican set up email addresses in six languages. Within two days, they received 56,000 emails and eventually the server crashed and there are just not enough people working in the mail office to go through that many emails. So it's back to snail mail. And the man in charge of the Papal Correspondence Office, as it is officially known, is Monsignor Giuliano Gallerini. The Pope receives all kinds of mail, letters, drawings, handcrafted gifts, poems. People often request prayers and even advice. When the office receives mail, they sort it by languages and then they read everything, yes? everything with great care and respect. The Pope does not respond to everything himself, but everyone does get a response. Monsignor Gallerini once explained that those who help with replying to the letters do so with the heart of the Pope and in his style. We must never forget that the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity, and the responsibility of everyone. And that's everything for this week. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send them via Vatican Connections Twitter page at Vati Connections. I'll be happy to answer them on our next episode. And if you are a returning viewer or new to the show, we at Salt and Light value your feedback on the content we produce. If you would like to tell us how we're doing, please visit saltandlighttv.org slash vcsurvey to send your comments directly to our programming team. Thanks again for watching and I will see you next week on an all new episode. <laughs>